Episode 22. And um, tonight we have uh, quite a varied show, although I don't have any guests. So um, what we're going to do this evening is I'm going to run you through some, uh, some video footage. But uh, a lot's been happening during the course of the week, so I'm going to take you up to speed with what's occurring. You have just watched a 45-minute documentary known as Gas Leak. Now, this is a documentary that uh, focuses pretty much on what's going on in southern Queensland. In fact, it's an area of southern Queensland that is pretty much equivalent to the size of the UK. And the reason that I wanted to show that documentary tonight is because Friday, last Friday, was the end of the consultation period by which DEC sought responses before it puts 64% of this country up for grabs bought by the unconventional gas industry. Now, the Australians, particularly in uh, Queensland, have been facing this nightmare for the past six years. And in that time, the state has gone from a beautiful, unspoilt, relatively unspoilt, arable farming uh, state to one that has been absolutely devastated by the unconventional gas industry. And right now, there is a massive rally going on in um, uh, Bentley, if we can pull this up on the screen here, going on in Bentley, northern New South Wales. And some 2,000 people have gathered there to prevent Magasco from getting their bits in the ground. This is an enormous response. People have traveled, in some cases, literally hundreds of miles to be at this rally. The people of New South Wales are well aware of the devastation that the gas industry has caused in Queensland and are determined to do everything they possibly can to prevent the same thing happening in New South Wales. So let's have a look at a, a short video from uh, Bentley. This is literally a video that's been released in the last uh, 24 hours or so. And look at the magnitude of the response to the call for support to prevent Magasco from getting its bits in the ground. We are getting towards victory. Just last week, the state government and the, mine, the mining companies started backing off and saying they won't go on farms where they're not welcome. That's not good enough, because if you go on one farm, you go on all the neighbouring farms through the water supply. We want two people in the city to hear it. No means no! No means no! No means no! No means no! no. no. The very, very important message to take back out to community is that today is a great victory of people power and it's a victory we need to repeat over the coming weeks. Well, here in Bentley, the numbers have swelled from 150 to over 2,000 almost overnight. This is absolutely unprecedented and it sends a clear message to Metgasco that there's absolutely no social licence in this area for them to continue their activities. It's pretty freaky. <laughs> Yeah. 
not a lunatic fringe. Over 2,000 ordinary people have given up their other commitments today to come here and protect the air, land and water. Magasco have only dug one tight sands well, the Kingfisher well. It was a disaster from day one. Leaked from day one until eventually it blew 200 metres of pipe in the air when they went to decommission it. There's an ongoing mine safety investigation into that well. Magasco doesn't know what went wrong and here they are at Bentley wanting to drill their second tight sands well. 2,000 people gathered in the Northern Rivers area of New South Wales. Compare that with the situation at Danes Hill, um, Bassett Law in Nottinghamshire. The picture on the screen here, here we go. And this was the first delivery with a major generator preceding the, uh, the rig coming into the site there. And barely half a dozen people blockading the, uh, the trucks. Nonetheless, very effective because uh, one protector climbed onto the top of the gates and padlocked himself there, and three protectors climbed onto the top of the generator. Now, it seems that Nottinghamshire is still in the process of training their uh, protester removal team, so uh, they had nobody to come along and uh, remove the uh, protectors. So after leaving them up there for a fair few hours, they uh, persuaded them that uh, if they came down, um, then they wouldn't be arrested. Well, having been up there for six hours or so, it was probably time to come down. They'd certainly made the point. And at the end of the day, if three people had been arrested, it would have decimated the protection community at uh, Bassett Law by 50%. Consequently, you know, the industry and the British government perhaps have some foundation in their belief that the number of active anti-fracking protectors is literally barely more than perhaps 30 to 40 people. But this is why it's so important to spread the word around the local community. We shouldn't be disheartened at what's occurring at Bassett Law. It's the same in Manchester. Prior to the camp arriving, the level of awareness in the Greater Manchester area was fairly minimal. Now there are burgeoning anti-fracking communities springing up in many communities around the Greater Manchester area as people become aware of the lies and the deceit and the deception being perpetrated by IGAS at uh, Barton Moss. Now, we've had a very interesting week. It looks like we're coming to the uh, end of the Barton Moss campaign. Uh, having spent uh, three months on Barton Moss myself uh, through ostensibly December, January and uh, February, and then tripping back for a few days every uh, couple of weeks or so since then. But the campaign there is uh, drawing to a close and the rig has been dismantled and is being shipped out as we speak. But uh, in a week that uh, was quite eventful in many respects, not least the fact that um, on uh, Wednesday of last week, oh, sorry, Thursday of last week, there was a rather uh, unusual visitor 
to the Barton Moss Police there. And this is none other than Assistant Chief Constable Ian Wiggett. And he apparently came along to uh, see for himself whether or not there was any truth whatsoever in the allegations of police brutality against the protection community at Barton Moss. So here he is in pensive mode there, actually thinking to himself, what brutality? This is very cordial. Um, but uh, nonetheless, he was put right. Here we see uh, Colin, um, ever present Colin, and Colin does a superb job of trying to educate the police and trying to encourage them to do their own research as to what it is that they are perpetrating here. So here we see a discussion between Colin and um, Ian Wiggett. But Ian Wiggett wasn't alone. He wasn't there in isolation. There was another gentleman there uh, with him. That's this gentleman here that you see uh, circled on the screen. And um, unfortunately, at this point, I don't have a name for him. But he is a member of the independent uh, panel for complaints, police complaints. And of course, most of the IPCC are ex-police officers, so um, the degree of independence uh, perhaps leaves a little bit to be desired. And giving him his own personal escort there is Inspector Ranheed, who has been one of the regular uh, frontline inspectors on the uh, Barton Moss convoys. And he was actually caught on video telling the IPCC representative there that what he was experiencing was a normal day at Barton Moss. Of course, there was much hilarity when uh, that observation was, uh, was expressed, and uh, it was pointed out to him that um, actually what he was experiencing was nothing like a normal day at Barton Moss because the police had elected not to do their usual pushing, shoving, kicking, punching, etc. And the TAU were nowhere to be seen. But nonetheless, I'm sure that uh, the um, independent member is quite capable of going online and looking at the irrefutable evidence that's on YouTube. Well, nonetheless, um, obviously, once he went home, then things pretty much went uh, back to normal. But it seems that the TAU haven't yet caught up with technology because the following day, they decided that they wanted to get the footage off of a particular protector's uh, phone. But the problem was he was live streaming. So here's a message to the TAU. When you live stream, the footage is going straight up onto the web and there is nothing for you to download from the phone. So next time that you want to try and make a grab for a live stream phone, then um, you know, maybe you want to think about just actually downloading it from the web. But uh, you know, we're not really too surprised, are we? So this was um, the Thursday, Friday, and also the reason that things perhaps hotted up on the Friday was because late on Thursday afternoon, the uh, appeal courts came to the conclusion that there was indeed a case to be discussed in the appeal that we had submitted uh, opposing the eviction order that had been put on the camp by uh, the judge a couple of weeks previously. Now, of course, the reality is that Peel Holdings and Digas thought that it was going to be a simple rubber stamping exercise when they submitted uh, the application to the courts and presented the camp with the eviction papers and uh, asked for an accelerated hearing. So the hearing was in three days. Of course, what uh, Peel Holdings and Igas didn't bank on was the protection community having access to an outstanding legal team. And my uh, eternal thanks to um, Ugo uh, Hayter and uh, Richard Stein of Lee Day, and certainly to uh, Lindsay Johnson, the barrister that represented the camp in the courts. And although it appears that uh, we lost the eviction case at the first hurdle, and the judge, reluctant to permit the appeal as he was, gave us barely 24 hours to submit an appeal to the uh, Court of Appeal in London. But at two minutes before midday, that appeal was granted. So the camp remains in situ. And now a hearing date has been set. Roll on the drums. 
The hearing date for the appeal is July the 16th. Now, on the basis that I guess will have vacated the Barton Moss well site, certainly within the next couple of weeks, that means that by July the 16th, uh, there won't actually be anybody on the Barton Moss site to evict. So this is going to present a very interesting state of affairs. You know, will Peel and IAGAS decide that they're going to pursue the case anyway? If they do, what will the response of our legal team be? At the moment, of course, the judge has decreed that all of the legal expenses uh, that uh, Peel uh, have incurred to date should be passed across to the named defendants, of which I am one of two. Uh, but um, we will be revisiting that uh, because it looks as though the Peel application may actually be vexatious. So let's see how that unfolds in the coming weeks. But it is thanks to the judiciary, and particularly the appeal court, that uh, the camp remains in situ, although, as uh, was acknowledged by one of the senior police officers, it really wouldn't have made much difference because the camp would have simply moved to another location. And in reality, the uh, response and support from the local community would have still been there. So the camp is still there, the protectors are still there, and even today there was a lock-on preventing the trucks from leaving at the desired time. So we'll take a look at the lock-on in a second, but uh, let's take a short break. Introducing the magazine for free thinkers. 100 pages of high quality color print. Packed with information the mainstream media will never tell you. Published quarterly covering a range of subjects including politics, history, science and technology. Uncensored magazine. Think for yourself. Back issues also available on CD-ROM in PDF format. To subscribe, visit worldwideweb.uncensoredmag.co.uk or call us on 0207-558-8869. And welcome back to part two of Fracking Nightmare. Now, Barton Moss campaign has uh, unfortunately um, generally experienced a mainstream media blackout. One or two pieces, of course, put out by the uh, rather unbiased uh, BBC, um, who of course uh, share the same landlord as IGAS, uh, none other than Peel Holdings. And as we showed a few weeks ago, um, when one of the BBC reporters uh, came down to do an independent review of the allegations of police brutality at Barton Moss, he actually arrived in a police car and left in a police car. So obviously a seriously embedded journalist there. And needless to say, the report was uh, a fairly typical BBC report. No surprises there. But um, on a national basis, obviously the British government is doing everything it can to try to win over the hearts and minds of the population and to convince them that the rush to exploit the UK shale gas is absolutely essential to the well-being of the economy. Well, on Tuesday of last week, uh, BBC Radio 2 uh, to great fanfare, announced that they were going to host a debate on hydraulic fracturing. And this was hot on the heels of the announcement, of course, that uh, uh, Russia was effectively uh, retaking possession of the Crimea following the uh, ballot there, uh, which um, a phenomenal majority of people voted in favour of a return to Russia. Uh, that's the ethnicity, of course, of the Crimea. And um, this uh, was announced, uh, obviously, against a response by the um, uh, UK and the US and the EU that there would have to be sanctions against uh, Russia. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the invasion, which, of course, wasn't an invasion, but the invasion of Crimea, 
was used as an excuse to try to ramp up the fear of gas shortages in the UK and push the agenda for the exploitation of unconventional gas in this country. So, the BBC Two, oh, sorry, BBC Two, Radio Two debate featuring none other than uh, Michael Fallon and a rather lame um, ecologist whose name escapes me from the Fylde Peninsula. But uh, he didn't really seem to be that anti at all. But the whole idea of the debate was to establish how many people had actually changed their minds as a result of events in Russia and who were previously anti-fracking but were now pro. So they invited calls and a number of people obviously called in and the first caller stated categorically that she had indeed changed her mind and one could sense the excitement in Jeremy Vine's voice that he was going to uh, be talking to a previously anti-fracker who had now become pro but unfortunately he was to be thwarted. You could hear the disappointment in his voice as the lady said she used to be pro, but now having looked at the evidence for herself and listened to the experts speaking on the subject, she was determinedly anti. Consequently, she absolutely nailed the debate in one call. And that was it, the debate was over, they quickly went on to another subject. So thank you very much, Jeremy Vine and BBC Radio 2 because that little episode was not lost on the discerning listener. But obviously the establishment isn't going to give up that easy. So the following day, none other than the epitome of the British gutter press, The Sun, allegedly read by some 13 million people in this country, and as always I use the term read loosely, but uh, on the front page here was you fracking hypocrite. And this was uh, a slight on Lord Cowdery for having the audacity to state categorically that he will not permit fracking on any of his lands in the south of England, particularly in Sussex. Well, on pages, uh, I think it was four and five, the Sun decided to go for broke and do a double page spread and really rip in to all those people who had the audacity to challenge this essential industry. So let's have a look at what they were doing here. They were targeting Greenpeace, uh, Frack Off and Friends of the Earth. Now, these are three completely autonomous organizations Certainly I have absolutely no relationship with any of these organizations and this is exactly the way it needs to be. So each of these organizations obviously are very much anti-fracking and doing everything they can to raise awareness within their particular sphere of influence. And then the Sun continues to point out to the, their readers all the red tape that prevents the frackers from getting their bits in the ground. And you know what, all of this red tape is there to protect the population, not just of this country, but of the EU. And I'm no great fan of the EU and the fact that uh, you know, some nearly 200,000 pieces of legislation uh, find their way onto the UK statute books as a result of unelected EU officials. But nonetheless, right now, I must confess that I'm extremely grateful for some of that uh, EU legislation. And hopefully their readers will look through this and become to the realization that every piece of red tape, as it's uh, dismissed here, is absolutely essential in trying to ensure that the ecology of this country, that the water, the soil and the air is protected from the mother frackers. And then to have another dig at uh, Lord Cowdery here and pointing out that uh, a big chunk of his family fortune actually comes from uh, being invested in the Mexican oil industry and calling him a hypocrite. But actually this is totally incorrect of course because Lord Cowdery may well have uh, made a significant chunk of money from the conventional oil and gas industry. 
And this is where the establishment, unfortunately, is, is actually trying to uh, mislead people. A significant proportion of the anti-fracking community is not directly anti-hydrocarbons. Sure, of course, there are a number of people who would like to see an immediate move away from the hydrocarbon reliance. But there are a significant number of people who recognize that you know, whilst that might be an altruistic, idealist goal, it's not going to happen overnight. And we are going to be reliant on conventional hydrocarbons for some time to come. And there are plenty of resources of conventional hydrocarbons to tap into without having to exploit the unconventional resources. And this is where Lord Cowdery is demonstrating that uh, he's quite capable of doing the research. He understands what is within reason, uh, acceptable, and certainly what is not. Yes, it would be ideal to move away from hydrocarbons, but you know the Kabul has got a vice-like grip on the global economy. And although certainly that has to be the ultimate goal, we've got to be realistic and recognize that it isn't going to necessarily happen in the immediate future. But this was the worst piece of the Sun propaganda. This, this is sign our petition. Dear Prime Minister, I urge you to start fracking now. Well, of course, there were a number of people who made the proposition that you simply cross out start and change it to stop. But unfortunately, that uh, really wouldn't have carried any weight. Not that uh, anybody in Downing Street is going to look at it anyway. But it would have obviously been a much more balanced piece of journalism if the Sun had actually given their readers the opportunity to choose whether or not this is something that they wanted to support or not. But no, Murdoch, of course, has to force the uh, opinion on the, the Sun readers and demand that they send their uh, uh, point of view to Downing Street directly. Well, you know, the reality is that uh, an increasing number of people all around the country, of course, are coming to the realization that this is not something that is acceptable anywhere in this country. It would be wonderful to think that we could get 2,000 plus people at every location where the unconventional gas industry has uh, got, is intending to get its bits in the ground. But there's a fundamental difference here. In Australia, and particularly in Queensland, they have experienced the degree of contamination, the magnitude of the negative health impacts, as you saw if you watched the documentary before tonight's episode of Fracking Nightmare. And consequently, the people of New South Wales just do not want this abomination in their state. So what is it going to take? Is it going to take that in this country there is a phenomenal degree of contamination. The scary thing is that the British government wants to establish about a dozen exploratory wells and then get them online as soon as possible across the country. So this isn't a case of let's do it in one place and see how we get on. They tried that in the uh, File Peninsula in the Blackpool area a couple of years ago and of course the well that they drilled and fracked resulted in the two seismic events there. So having failed once, what makes us think they're going to get it right next time? Then yesterday, there was a um, uh, meeting of the women of the anti-fracking community, primarily women. It was Mother's Day. And this was uh, an event uh, coordinated by Julie Wassmer, who you see on the um, right there, uh, holding up the placard of Mothers Against Fracking. And I believe that's actually Natalie Griffiths, is it? The leader of the uh, Green Party in the UK. Uh, but the, uh, I think the star attraction there was uh, Bianca Jagger. And uh, this is the um, raising of awareness that, uh, you know, primarily what we're trying to protect here is the next generation. You know, the impact of this industry is potentially not going to impact in this country in my lifetime. But the next generation, if the government gets what it wants and gets 64% of this country being exploited for shale gas, then the next generation are in serious trouble. So, meanwhile, today, this morning, it was announced that iGas 
finds UK shale formations on the site near Manchester. Now, this press release was actually released uh, first thing this morning. It says there at 11.49 a.m. It actually was released before 9 o'clock this morning. So having seen this, I anticipated that the stock price of iGas would rise from the uh, 121 that it closed at on Friday. So imagine my surprise when during the morning trading, the stock price went down to 117. And I, and I suspect some manipulation here, some deliberate manipulation to bring the stock price down so that as the information percolated out that iGas had found shale on the Barton, from the Barton Moss Exploratory Well, that the stock price would increase. And I believe it closed at around 123 and a half. So anybody buying at uh, 117 today um, managed to make a 5% gain over the course of the afternoon. But um, I'll leave that to the uh, stock exchange to uh, investigate that one. Well, then uh, John Blamire, the chief operating officer of uh, IGAS, made this observation. He says that fracking could make Liverpool a new Aberdeen. Well, this shouldn't come as any surprise at all because obviously over the past few weeks I've been talking about the symbiotic relationship between Peel Holdings and IGAS. And uh, it no surprise that the IGAS licenses effectively follow the Mersey and the Manchester Ship Canal. Land owned ostensibly by Peel Holdings. And I've also uh, discussed the report that was published by uh, Kilfoyle's company uh, on the way in which Peel Holdings went about establishing its dominion in Liverpool. And they are used to riding roughshod over anyone that gets in their way. Obviously, Peel Holdings have very, very deep pockets, which is why they expected to have a, an easy ride when they served an eviction notice on the Barton Moss community, because they work on the basis that nobody is going to put their personal wealth, their material wealth at risk by challenging Peel Holdings. So imagine their surprise when, um, you know, some of us said, you know what, go for it. Let's stand up. Let's put our money where our mouth is or our lack of money where our mouth is. And let's challenge the corporatocracy. This is what we have to do. It's what is absolutely critical if we are going to stand any chance of fighting this pernicious industry. So today, um, obviously, uh, I guess are trying to bring the rigs out. But uh, nonetheless, the Barton Moss protection community isn't going to give them a free ride. So here we see a couple of people with their arms locked into um, a, a cement lined casing. Actually, the whole idea, of course, here is to uh, actually simulate the, uh, the casing process, the drilling of the well, and then the cement being uh, up around the outside of the casing, and that was exactly the case here. And it took the Manchester Police uh, pr protester removal team, I think about uh, three hours or so to um, cut these uh, protectors free. Here's a, another angle there. Well, this of course has been the trial run. Balkan, was the, uh, the experiment, if you like. Barton Moss has been the opportunity to put the lessons of Balkan into practice. And now it seems that what we're gonna see over the uh, next few months is the opportunity to use these tactics in multiple locations around the country. But it is going to need people in the local communities, just like in Manchester, it's gonna need people to step forward and support their respective protection camps. Otherwise, these guys will get the bits in the ground and the investors will think they can make a fast buck. Let's take a short break. If you take an active interest in maintaining the optimum health and well-being of yourself and your family, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is the magazine you've been waiting for. Having taken Australia and New Zealand by storm, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is now available in the UK and Europe. Visit www.nzzjournal.co.uk or call 0800 
nznaturalmed.co.uk or call 01626 337 531 to order your copy now. And welcome back to part three of episode 22 of Fracking Nightmare. Now, I talked earlier about uh, the iGas stock price. And over the past week or so, I have contributed to a chat room of iGas, iGas investors. This is on the LSE. If you simply search for iGas stock chat, you can find the forum, sign up and feel free to come and uh, share your thoughts. What is very interesting, of course, although not surprising, is the magnitude of cognitive dissonance amongst those who are motivated by out-and-out greed. It is literally sheer greed and total cognitive dissonance with regard to the impact that this industry has on the environment and the devastation that it has left in its wake in the US, in Canada, and in Australia. And one of the crass comments posted by one of the pro-frackers today was simply, until such time as the gas poisons thousands of people, invest, invest, invest. This is what we're up against. This is humanity against even more insanity. And we, it's claimed that this is a novel industry. It's not a novel industry. In Australia, people are still taking note of people who come over to visit from the US to talk about their experiences. The people of New South Wales have traveled up into southern Queensland and talked to the farmers there about their experiences, the impact on their water supply, the contamination of their soil, the negative health impact, the nosebleeds, the headaches. The contamination causing uh, uh, skin disease, it's all there. All you have to do is look for it. But those driven by greed don't even want to look for it. Let's take a look at in the, in the US. In the US, we see on the uh, picture here, this is the number of acres damaged since 2005. So basically this is nine years. And, and this is probably a conservative estimate. But of course, this is a growing number, the number of acres lost. And of course, once this soil is lost, the likelihood of it being able to be returned to farming is slim to none. Here is um, Congressman Mark Pocan from Wisconsin. And uh, he made an observation in a hearing. He said, we don't know what's in fracturing fluid. People who live near these wells don't have the information that they need to know for their family's safety. You know, in Texas, more than 30 towns in Texas will soon be out of water as a result of diverting their underground water supplies for fracking. Actually, in reality, there are many towns in Texas that are actually out of water in West Texas, and their water is now being supplied by the gas industry. And as we've discussed before, in the US, the corporation has absolute priority over the citizen. Now, a lady who has made a very serious impact, a phenomenal impact in the US is a lady by the name of Vera Scoggins. And actually, I'm hoping that uh, Vera Scoggins will be our guest on next week's edition of Fracking Nightmare. Now, Vera has actually had um, a barring notice served on her, preventing her from going into large tracts of Pennsylvania. And uh, this um, order has been sought by Cabot Oil because Vera is having such an enormous effect in educating people in both New York and in Pennsylvania about the negative impacts of this industry. And I'm going to show uh, a short video. It's about five minutes long. And it's a video that uh, Vera took when she went to uh, take a, a visit to a frac site. Uh, this is actually Halliburton in mid-frac. And uh, what you're going to hear 
of course, is the, the, the noise that is associated with this frack. Now, we don't know uh, this particular well exactly how much was being pumped or for how long or for what depth. But uh, it was obviously, when you see the number of frack tanks, this was one big frack job. So let's run this video. This is the Hollenbeck site, Franklin Forks Road, Susquehanna County, Franklin Hill Township. December 15, 2011, 6.30 at night. side of this site.
So we haven't experienced anything like that in this country yet. But the most extensive frack job ever run was done in Canada. And that ran for 111 days. So imagine that noise level running for 111 days. Of course, in this country, we have uh, as yet to be advised as to how much liquids would be pumped over what period with what kind of horsepower. So these are all great unknowns, but um, obviously if the British government and the industry gets its way, then we will have some experience of that by the end of the year. In the meantime, we have to be sensitive to the language being used by the industry. They are beginning to realize, of course, that the term fracking is quite emotive. So they're using terms like acid, etching, otherwise known as a frack, and a mini fracks. Well, a mini frack is a frack. You know, what's a mini frack? Anything less than 111 days? You know, the reality is it's still a frack job, the same process. So, you know, let's not be deceived. Now, this is why it's so important to establish local community groups. It's the people in the local community who know the area, who can watch for the planning applications that are being submitted and can then get in touch with people in the other areas like Greater Manchester or in East Kent or in Sussex who have got some experience of following the planning process, following the Environment Agency's application and waste disposal application process and making sure that these individuals and the companies are uh, held to account. So there's nobody going to be riding in on a white charger. There is going to be no national organization. If there is a national organization, it will suffer just like national organizations have in at least one other country. They will be infiltrated by the establishment, by the industry and neutered. What we have in the UK is a tremendous opportunity. We have the fastest growing environmental community in this country. And it covers all parts of the social, political, religious and philosophical spectrum. And what is absolutely essential is that we focus on the issues that we agree upon, like fracking. And we don't get bogged down in the other issues where we may disagree. You may consider other issues to be equally important. But it is essential that we recognize that they are potentially divisive. It's never been more important to focus on what unites us and not get bogged down on what divides us. The establishment are past masters at driving the wedges. And if you hadn't seen it yet, check out last week's edition, episode 21 of Fracking Nightmare, where we reviewed the GCHQ presentation on Divide, um, on breaking down activist groups, destroying activists that have some impact. And uh, I'm not going to bore you with the gory details, but uh, having uh, talked about it um, last week, on Tuesday, I experienced a little bit of that myself. So it's out there. It's out there. But you know what? Bring it on. Because the people of this country will not tolerate this abomination. People in communities are uniting against this. We have yet to see the same order of magnitude as we saw earlier in the program at Bentley, but it's coming. As soon as the frack tanks start rolling down the road, you're going to see opposition like you've never seen before. Meanwhile, if you think that the work that we're doing is important and you would like to support us, then please consider making a donation which you can do via the website, uh, frackingnightmare.com, which I've been told is down this evening. Now, there's a surprise. All the other websites that we have on that server are functioning, but frackingnightmare.com isn't working. So the backup is to go to my own website, ianrcrane.com. If everybody watching this program considered donating just £5 a month, it would be amazing what we could achieve. Thank you for joining me tonight. And let's make sure that the mother frackers do not get their bits in the ground in this country. Thank you. Good night.